We're going to do uh, something a little different. I'm going to invite you to get a little bit comfortable. I'm just going to take my robe off here. It's a little Lenten stripping down. That's, it's going to stop right there. That's all we're going for. But I'm going to get a chair here. I'd like, if you can, if you're able, to get yourself in a chair, but sit, uh, sit like on the front half of the chair, like where you're in good posture. Uh, and get your feet as you are able. You approximate this the best you can, where your whole feet is on the ground. Uh, and then and, and get your shoulders up, roll back. This, uh, do what a, a choir teacher of mine used to say, make sure you're not crushing your instrument, that your, your lungs can fully inflate because you're not crushing them with your rib cage or your shoulders. Uh, if you haven't already, I'd invite you to just kind of place your hands on your knees and, uh, and shut your eyes. Not tightly. This isn't like, like, don't put any, let go of the energy you're investing in vision is what I'm inviting you to do. Uh, you might note uh, the play of light across your eyelids. Notice it for a moment and then just let it go. We're going to turn our sight inward and be at peace. Stomp your feet for a moment and then get them well grounded. You are rooted in earth. From earth you came, to earth you shall return. We don't tread upon the earth in a way of domination or command. We lightly walk upon the earth which gave birth to us to which we are a beautiful, good extension of until a time when we will go back to be one with it. You are grounded and rooted in dust. You might be hearing some things. Uh, when we stomped earlier, I'm on what basically amounts to a giant drum. I heard a lot of things. Note what you're hearing and then just let it go. Turn your hearing inward. Listen to your heartbeat. Listen to the breath as it comes through your nostrils and your mouth. Listen to your body. And be at peace. Take a big, deep breath. And exhale. Listen to the, the exhaling. If you didn't make enough noise the first time, do it again. Make a big noise about exhaling. That's wind. And every time you breathe in, you're breathing in a wind we call the Ruach Elohim. And a wind stirred over the waters of the deep. And the Spirit of God animated the people of Israel. And the breath of God animated the dust that was Adam and made it human. Every time you breathe, you are taking in the Spirit of God the breath of God. You are rooted in earth, but animated by heaven. You are the meeting place of heaven and earth, a clay jar in which God dwells. You are a walking miracle of life. Every time you breathe, You might be feeling the, the surface of the chair you're sitting on, or maybe your sock is bunched up in your shoe, or maybe there's some clothing that doesn't fit as well as it used to, and it's feeling snug. Just kind of shake all that off. Let go of it. 
Listen and feel instead to your body. Feel the ache in an old joint or the stitch in a tight muscle, the puckering of a scar. Feel like old friends your body. Sometimes you argue with it and sometimes you laugh with it, but no matter what, you journey with it. A journey of love, appreciation, and challenge. Feel your body and make peace with it. In this moment of letting go and paying attention, we transport ourselves. We're not anymore sitting in a living room or kitchen or bedroom or chancel of a sanctuary, but we create a bit of intentional wilderness of a space of solitude within ourselves to gift ourselves peace. If you are not, as so many of us are not, at peace within yourself, my prayer for you is that Lent could be a time of granting yourself peace, even if it is peace from yourself, within yourself. You can, if you will, open your eyes if you haven't already. Some of you got bored early and you created lists in your head. Let go of the lists. If you open your eyes, which I invite you to do, hold the focus Don't let it all come rushing back in. But hold the sense of where we are in this wilderness space. We don't have to play hide and go seek and run to the desert to become alone and to let go and to find clarity of self. We are continuing in our season of Lent where we're we're focusing a bit on the renewal that comes from wilderness with our eight R's of resurrection drawn from the wisdom of conservation, recycling, and renewal. So we began with repentance, and then we did refusing. What do we say no to? And this week, we're going to talk about reducing. And part of reducing is shutting down the cacophony of voices, even in our own heads, that give us a cluttered sense rather than a clear sense of self. It would be easy to imagine that we already covered reduce with refuse, right? We said no to things. This is the act of reducing, but it isn't. The act of refusing is is not allowing more to come upon me. Maybe it's an old more, maybe it's the return of a more, but it's something outside of us trying to come on us or in us or ask of us. So a hard task indeed, but not quite the same struggle that comes with reducing. Because to say we are going to reduce, we have to let go of things already in our inner circle things about which we have emotional attachment. Every act of reducing has a grief journey associated with it. Even if you're reducing something you love, 
Maybe even, or hate, sorry, I went to love. Hate, if it's something you don't like about yourself, it's still a part of yourself. To reduce from it is to say you're going to get rid of a part of who you are. I remember uh, watching a talk show about people who have grown their hair really long and the psychological identity work it takes just to cut your hair because that's a part of you. And that is true of us in all of our relationships, how we relate to people, how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to the things in our life, how we relate to the world around us. The act of, of reducing to create an a cappella life is a grief journey. It's identity work. And it isn't easy. It wouldn't be easy even if it was just you, yourself, and you, that doesn't work as well when I say me, myself, and I, I don't think, you know. Uh, but we live in a culture that will reinforce to you that you are only you as we know it in the stuff of your life. Hold that thought for a sec. If I asked you right now, so I'm going to ask you, so get rid of the if. When I ask you right now, what is your net worth? Where does your head go? Your head goes to how much you owe a bank before that house is yours. Or the fact that you're renting an apartment or you don't even have an apartment and now you're, the number's getting lower and lower and then we start asking questions about what kind of student loans do we have or what kind of credit card debt are we holding and how many companies are going to send us electronically or on paper a bill this week. And for far too many of us, that number starts to become a negative number as if somehow you have no worth. Your net worth isn't a dollar number. But our society will tell you it is. Because we have a society deeply entwined with the finances of life. Such that the clothes we wear and the car we drive and the house we go home to if we go home to a house is what defines the success and worth of our life. These things God primarily sees as, as an impediment to your identity are what we think defines our identity. Or so the story goes, because we don't have to buy into it, but it takes an act of countercultural resistance to say, no, I will not define my life like that. Ultimately, that is what the parable Jesus told us this week was about. It's easy to say, and it often is in the interpretation of the church, because we don't always do good work with the text, it is easy to imagine that Jesus is rebuking you saving for some retirement dollars or doing any kind of financial planning. I hear that rebuke. It's a tension we live in. Jesus is way more content being an itinerant teacher who didn't live till retirement age. Don't take financial planning advice from Jesus as I think what your pastor just said. But that doesn't mean he's wrong when he says, take care because greed is a horrible master. And that is not what identifies your worth. Let me tell you a story. There was a, a rich landowner. Now, uh, pause the story for a second. Jesus is talking to a bunch of sustenance-oriented people. They don't have grain houses. They don't get enough crops from the field to pay the tax that they owe in product and then have enough to store it in anything. 
This is who he's talking to. There is one not like you who has a big storehouse and who gets lots of extra from his field, probably from all his tenant farmers who owe him what the fields generate, and he stores it in this thing, and then he says to himself, I don't know if I have enough. I mean, it's full, but is that enough? And in his chasing after of enough to make sure he can secure his future without ever needing anyone else, even God, he said, tear that down, let's build a bigger one. They call it a rat race, not because they're in favor of rats. Sorry, little rats. Some of you may have them as pets. But rats are, uh, I read a book earlier on, they're swarming things. And the very nature of swarming, terrifying, eating the dead kind of animals grosses us out. Interestingly, we have enough awareness to call the seeking after our financial security as the rat race, but not enough to say that probably means I want nothing to do with it. It doesn't mean don't have good financial stewardship of resources and the world around you. But that is a conversation we have in community and embedded in our relationships. How does our stewardship reflect our values before God and before the community? Building bigger storehouses in the way of this parable was a refutation of both God and community. It says, when I've taken care of me in all the ways I imagine I may need to be taken care of, then I'll get around to thinking about other people. Only what does, happens in the completion of the story? God enters that story and says, oh, foolish businessman, You've just died, and you never got around to any of the good you imagined you could do. And all those things that you thought were important that don't define you don't come with you. And though they don't, what will begin to define you now is the regrets of all that we didn't do. The gift of wilderness is a gift to reorient our thinking towards not what all do I need, but what all don't I need. Uh, After college, I did a year of mission work in the Philippines. Uh, And I had a base camp in General Santos City in the southern part of Mindanao, which is the... uh, culturally and religiously Muslim and more native uh, and then some Christian, and I wanted to get into the interfaith mixing of the Muslim, Christian, and native religion. Um, So I was down in a community, and we had a base camp, but I would spend a month up in the mountains in different tribal villages now and then. And when we did that, uh, you hiked up, and all I took is basically a small school backpack. Um, And I'd always have this problem because I'd start out earlier on in the year saying, okay, what all do I need? You know, and I'd start trying to stuff stuff into this uh, backpack. I had had one of those, um, it was a backpack that that zipped into another backpack and and it could have the little part where you unzip it so it could stretch a little bit more, right? It's kind of like going to the, the next belt buckle loop on your belt so you can eat a little bit more Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, when I asked myself, what all might I need, I couldn't get it all in. But I learned to start asking, what can I get away with not taking? What little do I have to take? And then I started no longer zipping those side things open. In fact, I would go for a month with just two pairs of jeans, 
two shirts, a sheet, and my toiletries. One set of clothes to be hanging on the drying line and one being worn. I think I took an extra shirt that I used as a pillow. And you learned that you could get away with that. In fact, you didn't miss the things you didn't pack. Only for five minutes did you worry about, oh, what if I needed? And then your head just left that behind. When we start to imagine that I just need to get one more thing into the bag, you will never get to a place where you don't think one more thing needs to get in there. Let me tell you that secret of life. A friend of it shared with me years ago. You always think you need to make 10% more than you make right now, and then you'll be happy and content. You can always imagine that there's just one more item we need to get into the trunk of the car before we can go on vacation. You will always imagine the one next thing you need until we begin to say what little can we get away with it's not about decluttering our kitchen table though I confess before you I'm one that needs to do that it's about decluttering our life letting go of the idea that these things are what get us through the day and letting go of the idea that these things are what give our life worth and meaning and drawing instead a sense of clarity of purpose that it is the love of God made manifest in our life that gives us meaning. And it is the community of God and all creation working in concert that gets us through the day. And that's uncomfortable. And that requires a grief journey. But on the other side of it, you will find yourself able to breathe in a whole new way. And you will call it good. What is God inviting you to reduce in your life? About the stuff, about the relationships, about the juggling act of all the things you think you need. What is God inviting you to let go of that you might have life and life abundantly. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.